Good morning church. It's a great day to praise the Lord. I'm going to read from the book of Psalm, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Praise the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generation. Amen. What of God says, No eyes have seen, no ears have heard, but the Lord has prepared for those who love him. Let us pray. Let us worship him. Let us pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord. This morning we want to worship you, Lord, Father. We want to praise you, Father. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord Jesus. Help us to know you, Lord. Help us to exalt you and worship you, Father, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We welcome you in this place, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. We want to see you, Lord. Holy, 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 Lord Jesus. We want to see you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Amen. 
you go perfect in all your ways and you are perfect in all that you do thank you Lord Jesus that you are a savior that our life is in your hand Lord work in our life Father open our eyes Lord Jesus open the eyes of our heart Lord Jesus our mind Lord help us to focus on you Lord help us to look to you Jesus thank you for blessing us this morning with your presence thank you Lord for being with us every time Lord Lord I surrender this time into your hand Lord Jesus I make this prayer in Jesus name I pray Amen thank you church we are back again to the study of the book of Romans I do hope you remember all the blessings that we receive and that is something that most of us do remember we remember the peace that God gives us it's peace with God we remember that we had access to God through the favor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we remember of the glorious hope that he gave us it was, it was a hope that, that was a motivator, a, a, a builder of our faith. And our faith, without that, hope didn't exist. We had that hope. We also had the Christian character. It spoke about tribulations. It, we, we, we will face tribulations and those tribulations will produce perseverance and perseverance character. These are the benefits that we have received. We received character. Then we have received the love of God that was born, poured within us. These were the blessings that we received from justification. When we were justified. When we were declared righteous. Now we go ahead with the second section, which is a rather difficult section to understand but let's see how best we can understand it, you and me. I hope I can make it as simple as possible that both of us are on the same wavelength and understand this section, which is apparently 
uh, pretty difficult to understand because there are too many facts and truths that we see in it, but we cannot connect the dots. It's difficult to connect the dots. You will agree with everything from verses 12 to 21 of everything to be true. But where connecting the dots and making uh, and understanding it, making sense out of it, is rather difficult in this section. But I hope I do justice to this and uh, we will start right away. <clears throat> this is Romans chapter 1 verses 12 to 21. Now, I would like to begin by saying that how is it possible for God to save sinners in the person of Jesus Christ? It is rather difficult. Even when I was born again, I found it difficult to understand this. That in the person of Jesus Christ, I was saved. Uh, that to a person 2,000 years ago. It is difficult for many to understand this. Now I can imagine those who do not know Jesus Christ and you are talking to them this particular topic that in Christ Jesus you will be saved. It is rather difficult that they will understand this. So how is it possible? Let us, let us try and put these, these truths together to further understand what it is uh, all about. Okay, we understand but that somehow Christ took our place on the cross and how was such a substitution possible? Okay, we know that he took our place on the cross. He has substituted us on that cross instead of we going on that cross for the sins that we had committed. Paul answered this question in this section and these verses are the very heart of this whole letter to the Romans. So let us, let us, uh, uh, let us carefully look at each of the verses and try and understand this and connect the dots basically so that our understanding is better. To understand these verses, uh, let us look at some general truths about this section. There are some truths in this section that will help us understand this better so before we go to the truths of this section i want to i want to uh, give you a general uh, observation over here where there are there is for example i would like you to firstly note that there is a repetition of the little word one o n e one there is a repetition of this word in this section of uh, how many uh, i think 11 chapters uh, 10, 10, chap, uh, 10 verses, the, the, the word one in these 10 verses are written 11 times. And, and why is it so? This one, it only tells us of our identification with Adam and with Christ. So we have an identification with Adam and we have an, uh, an identification with Christ. And when they say one man, it re refers to either Adam or Christ. So I hope you're getting this clear. Okay. Now, secondly, you will see the, uh, you will note the repetition of the word reign, R-E-I-G-N, to reign, to rule, which is used five times. Now, Paul saw two men, Adam and Christ, and each of them reigning over a kingdom. So you will see a reigning or a ruling taking place in you because there are two kingdoms there are two kingdoms one is the the dominion that adam was given to be in charge of adam was given the dominion of all and and uh, uh, he uh, he was he was asked to rule over man he was asked to have dominion over over man and you will see that even christ who came as a king, he came to rule over a kingdom. So this is the second note of repeti repetition of the word reign. Paul saw two men, Adam and Christ, each of them reigning over a kingdom. Finally, note the phrase much more is repeated again five times. This means that in Jesus Christ, we have gained much more than we have lost in Adam. In Jesus Christ, we have gained much more than we have lost in Adam. So here we stand to uh, where, where we can see that it is an overpowering of the mightier one, God, who made things, all things new, that we may step into this 
realm of a new creation that he had planned for us if only we believe if only we receive his son our lord jesus christ as as our lord and savior so let's go let's go ahead in short this section is a contrast of adam and christ so all my points will be a contrast all my points will cover contrast of adam and christ in some way or the other and uh, when we go forward you will realize that there is indeed a great contrast in this whole section in so many ways so adam was given dominion over the whole creation he sinned he lost his kingdom because of adam's sin all mankind came under condemnation and death because of his failure of his failure where he sinned we all came under condemnation and death christ came as the king over the new creation and by his obedience to the cross only by his obedience to the cross we see that he brought in righteousness and justification righteousness and justification and what is justification justification is you are declared righteous so he brings in righteousness and then when you believe in the work of christ on the cross then you have been declared righteous also the word of god says that righteousness is imputed in you now here you fall into an area where you are a new creation okay so we will we'll go forward uh skeptics sometimes ask was it fair for god to condemn the whole world just because of one man's disobedience was it fair didn't you think about this in the years gone by was it really fair but let's let me let me explain this the answer of course is that it was not it was not only fair but it was also very wise and gracious of god that he held the whole of mankind responsible for the disobedience of responsible in the sense we also had death come into us because of the sin of adam but in a way we are responsible because of that original sin because of that adamic sin because of that first sin which is ideally and aptly called the root of sin because of that root of sin we have borne the fruit of sin so in a way we become responsible bring up bringing about the fruit of that root of sin of adam okay so that's how we have begun sinning but that root of sin is in us when we are born which in other words in very simple terms we may not have sinned the sin of adam but we have been born with the nature of sin with the sin nature in us and that sin nature in us tells us that we are prone to bear the fruit of sin which we have done now let's say that jesus did not hold whole of mankind and would would test each one of us individually for the sins that we have committed you know something yet the result would be disobedience because there is not one man who was born of adam that has not been born with the sin nature in him so all of us have been born with that sin nature which on 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 our maturity for blossoms into the fruit of sin are we getting this clear so here we see that if that was the case that it is only when we sin that we are responsible then babies would not die 
death has come to babies also because they have not sinned. But death has come to a baby because of the sinful nature that is in that baby. Have you, have you seen why we have been made responsible for this because we have carried the sinful nature in us. That even when a baby who doesn't know what is right from wrong, doesn't know what is darkness from light, even that baby, death has overcome them at a very young age. Now that the reason for us uh, uh, having death in every man born since Adam is because we belong to a racial head, we belong to a race, we are a human race and our racial head is Adam. So I think I, think I made it pretty clear over here that our racial head is Adam and that's why each one of us has death that has come in to grip us sometime or the other whether you are as a baby or as an adult okay God was then able to save the human race through one man Jesus Christ now you can see over here it's even more important that because he he had uh, he he made it, made man responsible for that one disobedient act of adam and that entered mankind and every man then it becomes much easier because of the racial head that we belong to because of the race we belong to then it is easier that through one man jesus christ he can save all so this is uh, this is the reason why uh, it is only but fair and also wise and gracious that the whole world gets condemned because of that one act of disobedience of, of Adam. Okay. Each of us is racially united to Adam so that his deed affects us. The fallen angels cannot be saved because they are not a race. They have to be judged individually and they were judged individually and one third of them were sent cast down with Satan. So they were each judged in individually. There, are, they, there can be no representative to take their judgment for them and save them. There is no one who can save the angels. But because you and I were lost in Adam, our racial head, we can be saved in Christ, the head of a new creation. Christ is the head of the new creation. God's plan was both, both gracious and wise. Our final question would, must be answered. How do we know that we are racially united to Adam? How do we know this? The answer is in the first three verses 12, 13, 14 of chapter 5. The argument runs like this. We know that all men die, but death is the result of disobeying the law. Death comes as a result of disobeying the law. There was no law from Adam to Moses. Now let me read these three verses. You will get better clarity. Verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So sin existed from Adam right up to the law time the law was given to Moses. Sin existed, but it was not imputed in man. Because the law had not yet come. It is only when the law came that sin was imputed in man. So, and verse 14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So sin was not imputed in man 
but because sin existed over there death death reigned from adam to moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of adam so are we seeing over here sin was not imputed but because of that sinful nature death existed in us waiting to grip us and be done with this is what existed right from the time of adam right up to moses when the law came the sin was imputed in us there was no law from adam to moses but when but men still died a general result that demands a general cause what is that cause it can be only one thing the disobedience of adam the disobedience of adam adam did not have the law but god commanded him one thing to do and he disobeyed thus sinning he disobeyed he transgressed and these are the things that permitted although sin had existed he death also reigned from his time when adam sinned he ultimately died all of his descendants died yet the law had not yet been given what's the conclusion they died because of adam's sin you see in genesis 5 you can see the genealogy of adam and every man mentioned over there down below said and you know can it went on and on and on it ends by saying and he died in other genealogies it is not mentioned about that but god brings about over here that this is what has happened that <coughs> they died because of adam's sin for that all have sinned romans 5:12 it means all have sin in adam's sin you see in verse 12 it says because all sin it ends verse 12 ends because all sin okay so we go ahead men do not die because of their own acts of sin otherwise babies would not die men die because they are united racially to adam and in adam all men die i told you the root of sin will produce the fruit of sin okay having understood these general truths about the passage we may now examine the contrast that paul gives between adam and christ and between adam's sin and christ's act of obedience on the cross let us look at these contrasts okay there are five contrasts over here and i would like to uh, uh, run you through all five of them so that we see this contrast and we can connect the dots and make better understanding of this section so adam the very first contrast is adam's offense is contrasted with christ's free gift verse 15 but the free gift is not like the offense for if by the one man's offense many died much more the grace of god and the gift by the grace of the one man jesus christ abounded to many because of adam's trespass many died because of christ's obedience the grace of god abounds to many bringing life okay you see in that point 1 Adam's offense is contrasted with Christ's free gift. He brings life in it. The word many means the same as all men in verse 12. You see the end of verse 12, all men. Many means all men without any exception. It doesn't mean that many and that some of you there are exempted. No. Without any uh, exception it is all men. Okay. not the much more for the grace of christ brings not why why much more it says i 
I think this is worse. Uh, note, the much more for the grace of Christ brings not only physical life. Why does it say much more? Why is it mentioned much more? Because it does only bring, doesn't only bring physical life, it also brings spiritual life. And you know something? It brings eternal life and an abundant life. And this is what is much more we receive as much more we receive than what we have lost in Adam. In Christ, we have received much more than we have lost in Adam. Okay? Christ did conquer death and one day will raise the bodies of all who have died in Christ. If he stopped there, if he just raised the bodies, that's it. Then he has only reversed what Adam had done. But he didn't stop over there. You will see. He went on to do much more. He gives us eternal life abundantly. He gives us life, spiritual life and abundant life to all who trust him. As mentioned in John 10.10 10, For I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. So it is not just a reversal from death to life again but he will give it to you more abundantly. We have seen in, in, in Galatians 2.20 also. It says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And, 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 and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See what he says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified in Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I am now dead. When you believe in Jesus Christ, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and when I speak the word believe, the word believe means to obey Jesus, to follow Jesus. Not just a, a mind over matter belief that many of us have. We believe in Christ, but we are walking on a different path. You don't say that you believe in Jesus Christ then. Today people say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, He is my God. But they have embraced pride as their God. They have embraced uh, corruption as their God. They have embraced anger as their God. They have embraced the world as, they, as their God. They have embraced my, money and finances as their God and they think that just by saying that Jesus is my God makes him their God I'm sorry to say this since but you and I must understand if we say that we believe in him it's not a mind over matter uh, thing but it is listening to his word obeying his word and following him and that's why the great commission he ends it by saying, teach them to obey. He only didn't say make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But he said, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. If we fail in this area, says, to have learned all his commandments and follow him, that is truly taking up your cross and following him. Let's go to the second contrast, the verse 16. The effect of Adam's sin is contrasted with the effect of Christ's obedience. I repeat, the effect of Adam's sin is contrasted with the effect of Christ's obedience. Okay, I'll read verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many of from many offenses resulted in justification. We were declared righteous. 
what a wonderful thing what a wonderful work on the cross we'll talk about that a little later in a in, in a point down in the fourth point we'll discuss that that in 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 more detail okay christ work on the cross brings justification when adam sinned he was declared unrighteous and condemned when a sinner trusts christ he is justified declared righteous in christ let us go to the third contrast the third contrast is the is verse 17 i will read for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one jesus christ here you will see that two reigns are contrasted two reigns because of adam's disobedience death reigned okay one is death reigned if you read the book of gen- of the gener- uh, of the generations of adam the genealogy of adam i had, I had mentioned this earlier in, in in genesis 5 and note the solemn repetition of the phrase and he died In Romans 5:14 Paul argued that men did not die from Adam to Moses for the same reason that Adam died breaking a revealed law of God for the law had not yet been given not because they broke any law <laughs> The wages of sin is death It was the wage of sin it was not the law the breaking of the law that brought death it was the wage of sin it was it was that sinful nature that brought death to us okay now on this hand is this one ruling or one reign of death in man's life because sin was reigning in men's lives death was also reigning okay but in jesus christ on the other hand we enter a new kingdom for the kingdom of god is not not about eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the holy ghost and this therefore being justified by faith we are declared righteous we have peace with god and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of god note that it is we who reign over here god allows us through jesus christ through the work of on the cross that we be able to reign our lives through righteousness through peace with god and to rejoice in the hope of the glory of god can you see the two reigns over here much more they shall reign in life by one jesus christ it is mentioned in verse 17 yeah So in Adam we lost our kingship but in Jesus Christ we reign as kings and we reign much more our spiritual reign is far greater than Adam's earthly reign for we share abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness Now let us come to the fourth the fourth uh, contrast it is the contrast of of one acts Uh, the two one acts each one does one act adam and christ now these two one acts are contrasted one of adams one of christ this is in verses 18 and 19 i will read 18 and 19 therefore as through one man's offense judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation even so through one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men and resulting in the justification of life can you see the contrast here one brought condemnation and judgment the other one has uh, uh, the other one resulted in justification of life and verse 19 says for as by man's disobedience many were made sinners so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous how wonderful this is so these two acts are contrasted over here adam did not have to commit a series of sins make a note over here he didn't have to uh, 
commit a series of sins. Adam did not have to commit a series of sins. In one act, God tested Adam and he failed. In just one act, he tested Adam and he failed. It is termed as an offense, as an act of disobedience. The word offense means trespass, crossing the line. When you cross the line that you have been contained by, you have been told not to cross this line. You know, if an Indian Air Force uh, 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 plane crosses the LOC, line of control between India and Pakistan, or vice versa, if Pakistan aircraft come into it, he is straight away shot. The aircraft is shot down because he has trespassed the line of control. Likewise, God had put a boundary for Adam. He had said of every tree of the garden, you may eat freely, but of the fruit, but of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat. And in the day that you eat, you will surely die. You saw this? What God told Adam, you will surely die. Adam was not meant to die, ever. And all of us would have never died, ever. But Adam disobeyed, he trespassed, he com com committed an offense. He broke the commandment of God and then he had to die and death came in and reigned in Adam. Can you see this one act? In contrast to the trespass of one is the righteous of one, meaning the righteous work of Christ on the cross. Saints, it's just not that Jesus went on the cross, died and you'll find it difficult to understand how I am saved because of that. It is the work of the cross. It is the work of the cross. It is the righteous act. It is the work of the cross that permitted the righteousness to be imputed in us. He has put a garment of righteousness over us. He has, in other words, he has imputed righteousness in us through the work of Christ, through the work of the cross, done by that one man, Christ. You know when Isaiah said about filthy rags, righteousness, your rag, our, our righteousness is like filthy rags, he says. Why did he say that? But see the verse just before that, in chapter 64. That, it, this verse just before uh, uh, this verse of your right, our righteousness is like filthy rags, it says we need to be saved. We need to be saved. So don't you think that today your righteousness, after you are saved, that today your righteousness is filthy rags? That righteousness, you are called, you and I are called to be righteous in all that we do. And that righteousness has come from the work of the cross by Jesus Christ. We have no party to this. We can't take credit of it. But indeed we can exercise the righteousness of Christ in us first for us and then for us others. Mind you that you do not use this righteousness on others, teaching them what is right, and you yourself fail miserably in this righteousness that God has imputed in you when you first believed, through the work of the cross. I hope you have a better understanding of this. It is one of those many scriptures that are very badly very wrongly understood. It reminds me of another scripture where it says, judge not for you will be judged. The whole context has been taken, this, this verse has just been taken out of context. If you look into your word of God, if you know your word of God, in Hebrews it is mentioned that there is a time, a time will come when you will judge angels. If you can judge angels, can't you judge on earth? Can't you judge man if you if you're going to judge angels? Is it not possible for you to judge on earth? So these are some uh, some I would say cliche. They've turned these verses into cliche verses that people very loosely uh, use and 
misconstrue the whole understanding because they've taken taken it out of context. Let's go further. Now Christ's sacrifice on the cross not only made possible justification but also justification of life. Okay, also justification of life. He has mentioned it here, here at the end of 18. To all men resulting in justification of life. Now we must try and understand this justification of life. Justification is not merely a legal term. Justification is normally a legal term used in the word in, in the court of law. And it results in a uh, but over here he's saying, but also justification of life. Justification not merely a legal term that describes our position before God, just as if I had never sinned, but it results in a certain kind of life thereafter. It is the kind of life that you and I need to lead, which is called justification of life. It is the end of verse 18 in Romans 5.18. And it's parallel to, to be made and it's parallel, uh, parallel to be made righteous in Romans 5.19. You see in 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. This is what we call sanctification. We get better and better and better. They are being made righteous. Okay? So it is justification of life. In other words, our justification is the result of a living union with Christ. It is the result of a living union with Christ. And this union ought to result in a new kind of life. A righteous life of obedience to God. Our union with Adam made us sinners. Our union with Christ enables us to reign in life. Correct? Our union with Adam made us sinners. Our union with Christ made us reign in life. Justification of life. Our heaven begins here, saints. The love, joy, peace, patience, the, the faithfulness, goodness, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control, all of it has begun now. This is heaven. The work of the cross has brought heaven and the kingdom in us. The kingdom in, is in us. Our heaven has begun. Don't wait to enter heaven. This is enough of a foretaste of what heaven is when we actually come into heaven. But what God has given us through the work of the cross by Jesus Christ he has given us a foretaste of heaven. If today you are not filled with the love of God, the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace of Christ, the, 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 the patience that, that you and I are called to have, the character that we build, the hope that we have, the love that is poured into our hearts, if we do not exercise all this and live this, You are not a Christian. You and I are not Christians. <laughs> now let's go to five. Our fifth contrast. It is law and grace are contrasted over here. It is in verse 20 and 21. I'll read verse 20 and 21. These are the last two verses since. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. See, much more again. Everything that Christ did, he gave us in abundance. He gave us much more. The grace that, that came was abounded even much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
the law see what the first word was first line says moreover the law entered that the offense might abound the law entered now at this point of time the law entered when the law was given to moses law entered okay in other words there are some some uh, some uh, versions who says the then law crept in another version says then the law came in beside so the law came alongside okay grace was not an addition to god's plan grace was a part of god's plan from the very beginning it didn't, it wasn't an addition to god's plan it was right from the beginning god dealt with adam and eve in grace it wasn't it he dealt with the patriarchs in grace he he actually for adam and eve he actually uh, just imagine he had uh, he had leaves sewn together to cover their uh, uh, to cover themselves then if they were ashamed of their bodies out of grace that was done out of grace right from that time there was grace okay so he 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 showed his grace uh, he dealt with adam and eve in grace he dealt with the patriarchs in grace uh, abraham sinned uh, all everyone noah sinned everyone every patriarchs even the patriarchs whether it was abraham isaac or or, uh, or jacob they all sinned in some way or the other but it was grace that god when they sinned grace abounded god dealt with them in grace and he dealt with the nation of israel in grace he gave the law through moses not to replace his grace but to reveal man's need for grace i repeat he gave the law through moses not to replace his grace but to reveal man's need for grace law was temporary but grace is eternal the law was temporary today we are not governed by the law we as believers we who are reigning in our life if you are true believers you are reigning in your life you are reigning through righteousness you are reigning through justification because you have been declared righteous and you have obeyed and com- uh, all every command of his and continue to do so till such time we are made perfect when we enter into his realm into the glory of the father but as the lord made man's sin increase god's grace abounded even more god's grace was more than adequate to deal with man's sin even though sin and death reign in this world god's grace is also reigning through the righteousness of christ the christian body is the whole christian body is subject to death and his old nature tempts him to sin but in jesus christ he can reign in life because he is a part of the gracious kingdom of christ you cannot help being in adam you surely can cannot help being in adam but you can help staying in in adam for you can experience a second birth you cannot help being in adam but you can help staying in adam we are we are yet in the body by receiving the new birth that's why jesus ended it by saying he, he he said in john 37 you must be born again since you and i must be born again you and i must have the kingdom of god come to us you and i must have the righteousness imputed to us you and i must have that justification which means righteousness declared we are declared righteous and when we are so when righteousness is like a garment over us when it is imputed in us then only we can reign in our life we can reign our life we can rule our life that we may that people will see our good works and glorify the father in heaven saints let us make a decision today 
to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and make a commitment to Him that He will give you a better understanding of what it is to believe. That we need to obey just as He had obeyed the Father in Heaven. Obeyed unto death, even unto death on the cross. He obeyed the Father. It was the worst mode of, of uh, punishment, death on the cross, crucifixion. But he obeyed him right to the end. I pray to God that each one of us is also imputed with that ability to obey him. To know what is right from wrong. To know what is good from evil. To know the incorruptible from the corrupt. That it will rain our hearts that we take the path of steps ordained by Him that we do, do not be led by the flesh but by His Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us partake of the Lord's table. I'd like to think, I would like you to think about it. If you have not been doing what I have said that you need to do, I pray that you will confess it to God. Just confess to God your sin that you have never taken His word seriously. Confess to Him that, he, that you had never looked at it that you, He expected you to reign your life from now on through the righteousness of Christ. For you have been declared righteous. He has given us, He came to identify Himself with us by His body and blood. Because all man has a body and blood. He too came in flesh and blood and he had a commonality established that we may learn from him what God meant for, for us. That's why he came as a human being, that we may understand him more than he can understand us. He already knows us. He has created us. There is no need for him to come to, to become a man to understand us. He actually went through temptation to know what you, who you go through. He wanted to identify himself with you and with me. On the night he was betrayed, he knew that this was the time that he was going to put forth to you that he's going to give himself up you and I may live. He took bread. He gave thanks to the Father in heaven. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat of this. This is my body which will be broken for your sins. Eat of this. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood. It should be shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember that I have come to strike a commonality between you and me because I love you and I have given myself up for you. That you may believe in me. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. For saints, as long as we do this, we declare Jesus 
died on the cross, resurrected and he will come again. Amen. same love he poured into our hearts once we said yes to him. Once we said yes to his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the, his love be your portion. I pray that the peace of Christ, that, is, that the word of God says surpasses all understanding and will guard your heart and your mind. That peace will be with you. This is the peace also, which was a blessing that we have received, just like love. This is the peace, that, the blessing that we have received. 
from being justified and last but not the least the powerful holy spirit i pray that you and i will fellowship with we will commune with him that we be able to reign in this life we be able to rule in this life and we will truly be called the sons of god this i pray for you in jesus name and the people of god said amen and amen god bless you